What's going on guys? It's Coach Steven with 15 points of tennis. And welcome to part three on rotation. Now we already discussed axis of rotation, over rotation, unit turn, spine versus hip rotation. So what else do you need to know? Well, one of the most important but overlooked concepts is understanding the feet, all right? When both rotating on the ground and in the air, all right? Guys, your feet are the foundation of your stroke. You get this wrong and everything else falls apart. So hopefully you've watched parts one and two on rotation as, long as, a, as well as the weight transfer series to give more context to this video. Appreciate you guys supporting the channel. Hit that subscribe button if you have not yet already. We're gonna get started right now. Picking up from part one, the rule of over rotation is that I can only turn as far as my front toe is facing. All right guys, because the feet, they govern the hips in terms of locking and unlocking, Okay, if my front toe is facing the side fence, it's locked. So if I try to rotate past this point and hit, see this hip is gonna knock me off balance with this locked hip. If I wanna rotate through, I need to unlock this front hip by facing this toe diagonally toward the net post or even slightly toward my target. Now when I swing, I can clear this front hip, rotate, finish my weight transfer on balance. Now nothing is more Indicative of that is when you hit a close stance out wide, usually on the backhand side, okay, where you're forced to step across your body like this. Now my front toe is facing that side fence. All right, in that case, I need to hit and then pivot this toe. And by pivoting, it's unlocking that hip, allowing my rotation to finish. I wanna move through this quickly because we did cover it in part one, but it's important to understand the terminology when you see that front toe facing sideways and it restricts my hip, that is locking the hip. Here is the unlocked hip. As you can see, I can rotate through, bring my knees together and finish on balance. So again, the locked hip and the unlocked hip. So if you can get to the ball on time, please make this diagonal toe a habit when you're hitting stationary. If you have to hit and move through the ball because you have momentum, you have to hit and step over like you see here. That step over, again watch one more time, hit and then step, allows you to not over rotate and throw yourself off balance, but that pivot of the foot is going to be very essential moving forward through this video. So that's a stationary backhand when I get to the ball early. And you're going to see after this shot, when I still have momentum to my left, I'm going to hit and then pivot. All right guys, now similar to how the front foot locks and unlocks that hip, your back foot plays an equally important role as well. So whenever you're setting up, whether it's for an open stance here or a closed stance here, this back toe needs to be facing the side fence always, every single time. The first of the reasons is for strength and stability because your feet are your base of power when setting up for your shot, okay? Now when I take my feet and rotate them outward and open my toes up, my hips open up. When I turn my feet in, my hips close. Now I want you to try this wherever you're standing right now, okay? Wherever you happen to be. Point all 10 toes facing forward and unit turn back and forth as fast as you can, like, like this, okay? Feel that. Now open your toes open at 45 degree angles and now unit turn as fast as you can. You should feel a lot more leverage with those toes facing out, okay? Your feet gripping the ground and engaging your glutes here. And that's the reason why on this setup, this foot needs to be sideways every single time in order for you to push off and rotate from a strong position. So in order to unit turn with strength and power and speed, it all starts with getting a strong base we're going to pause and even if the ball is coming fast, look where my back foot is so I can just turn instantaneously okay, and rotate. My glutes are a lot more engaged. My hips can swivel better. It's the start of many, many wonderful things to come. Now the second reason, guys, has to do with your strike zone. Okay, If my back toe is facing forward like this, 
I can't complete my rotation back. See the difference between here versus now turning the foot here, all right? And this is extremely important for my power zone to hit the ball boo, strong. You're gonna see from the side camera, right? As I get fully turned, I need to hit the ball again, right here where my core is engaged, not reaching out in front where I have no power. So by getting this complete and full turn backwards, what I've done is create space from my backswing right here to my contact point right here. So I can build this momentum and really crush that ball, all right? Now, let me turn this foot back facing forward, facing the net, all right? And as you can see, to rotate, I have no space from here to here, right? I don't have any space to turn. And look, if I do turn my hips, what happens? I'm already reaching out in front, okay? And worst, worst of all, I'm actually pulling my hips off the ball at contact. Now, pause a sec because in part two, we did the spine rotation drill where we had you hitting with all 10 toes facing forward and going turning, boom, turning, boom. And that was a great drill to teach you how to keep your hips quiet, but don't ever hit like this in the match. Again, with this toe facing forward, you're gonna be, every time you just move your hips slightly like this, look, I'm already early and pulling off the ball, timing the ball out in front. Here's a spine rotation drill from part two where all 10 toes are facing the net and therefore he must keep his hips quiet. Because, why we just explained, there's no room to turn his hips. He starts trying to turn him, his hips, like in this example, and look on the right side of the screen. The ball's flying because his hips are pulling at and through contact, throwing his contact point off. It might seem complicated, but the fix is incredibly simple. Every time you hit, whether it's close stance, just like that last shot, and now you're going to see in open stance, regardless, watch his back toe. It just needs to get sideways every single time. Now there's space to turn that hip, hip up to contact and the hips don't need to rotate and pull through contact the residual momentum of the racket will carry him around so it's still at contact and then it rotates around if you get that back toe sideways whether it's close or open stance and as long as you don't over rotate i guarantee you you're going to be in good shape so there should be nothing conflicting about getting your back toe turned sideways, rotating your ankle at contact to, to turn your hip, which turns your shoulder, but to keep your body still at contact so you don't pull off the ball. In the points you're going to see when he gets that right toe sideways to rotate into contact there, okay, this next ball very much sideways. I'd love to see that. He's going to hit the ball right in his power zone compared to this last shot where the hips move at contact and you hit the ball too early, the ball takes a nose dive into the net. Again, I always want to get that back toe sideways, leave space for my hip to turn into the ball and crush the ball in my power zone. Now the third reason has to do with timing. See, your back foot, okay, getting it turned sideways, it locks the back hip in the sense that I cannot complete my rotation forward here, you see, until I unlock this back hip by turning my ankle and finishing my ankle snap, rotating through here, okay? So what this does is it creates a timing mechanism. By getting this foot sideways, I have to stay turned until the ball reaches my strike zone. Again, my forward rotation is restricted, okay, until Again, the ball reaches right at this point, and I can snap that ankle at contact. I've seen a lot of players who don't get this foot turned properly, and even though it's possible to wait and wait and wait and wait right for the ball to come into your strike zone, hit it right back here where you're strong, there is a tendency subconsciously over time to start hitting the ball further and further out in front and losing that contact point and hitting weaker and weaker. All right, so again, keeping this foot turn keeps your body turn until that very last moment to unwind at contact. I've seen players who start hitting short, over spinny, and weak, and they think it might be something mental, but no, it's actually their technique breaking down. And look at that front foot, not getting it turned sideways. 
And while he doesn't space the ball well here, this is what happens to a lot of players, okay, when their hips are rotating through and they're hitting the ball so far out in front of them. By getting that back foot turned, it's that timing mechanism. He knows, and he's done it so much, but he can feel when that ball comes right into that power slot, that power zone, and it's just money every single time. It's solid off his strings. So if you can wait for the ball to reach your power zone and hit it solid and square on the strings, you will never hit spinny, weak, and your strokes won't get tight, I guarantee that. And if you're a player who overspins the ball when it comes slow to you, you need to triple check this concept. Wow. Alright, now additionally, this back foot, getting it turned sideways, is essential for your ankle snap, alright? Because when you hit a, you're hitting a close stance, right at contact, this ankle needs to snap sideways here. Boom, it turns here, right? Just like that. Same thing with open stance. Whether you're pivoting on the ground, this ankle snap turns sideways. Or if you're jumping in the air, oftentimes in open stance, what you can do is jump to release the hip off the ground, like so, like this. But that ankle snap is still turning like this in the air. So, boom, okay? And that's why you get that foot sideways. And it's really among these reasons that we call this sideways foot the governor because it controls all aspects of the swing. Glute activation, timing, your strike zone. So it's one of the most important technical aspects make it a habit. The one exception to the governor in getting this foot sideways is when you're hitting a running shot moving forward, okay, and I'm, I'm gonna step like this with my toe facing the net. In this case, I'm not getting a ton of power from my hips right here. Most of my power is just coming from that forward momentum moving forward rather than my rotation. I know this seems like overkill, but it's so important, especially when you're waiting for balls that come slower. Again, so you don't hit weak and start overspinning the ball. Watch the timing of the an ankle snap, how, how he holds and then he snaps right at contact. Now please only focus on the feet, the ankle snap. That's what we're watching for. Okay, this open snaps, the ankle snaps from out to inward. It turns in right at contact just like any other shot. And this helps sink the upper and lower body. Same thing on this upcoming short backhand. Instead of timing the ball early, the governor keeps me in check, allows me to wait for the ball. Same thing with that my back ankle. I hit a great backhand right in my strike zone, but I just failed to put the point away. We'll now show you the, an example of when you can break the rule of the governor, that sideways toe. So not this shot, but the one after. I'm going to show you how that front toe is facing forward, but since I'm moving forward, I can keep my hips quiet and just hit with upper body rotation. Not much hip movement, and that's okay for a running shot moving forward. I'll show you one more. This time, I don't do as good of a job keeping my hips quiet, and if the ball is coming heavy, so this shot right here, I move my hips a little in contact and it goes wide. Now we're going to apply this concept to rotating in the air. All right, mirroring the mechanics of a helicopter. When you rotate extremely hard, <clears throat> that momentum actually lifts you off the ground so you'll rise <clears throat> as you rotate. Now we can apply this to both in an open stance here <clears throat> and a closed stance <clears throat> like so. All right, when you need a little bit more rotational juice, but we wanna make sure we have the right controls in place so the ball just doesn't hit the back fence, all right? Now to walk you through this, look, when I'm on my setup, I'm going to weight transfer and initiate my rotation on the ground. As you can see, since my feet are locked, being on, in the ground, I can't rotate, so I need to jump in order to release the hips. So I'm going to jump and rotate as one unit here, all right, to bring that rotation around. Now, note that your feet should release, turn, and land together okay it, sh it shouldn't be like it shouldn't be like this okay the hips move as one unit and whether it's a closed stance here it's going to be a little bit bigger and an open stance same thing just that weight shift rotate is going to be more abbreviated 
So weight shift, rotate. We want to provide a lot of examples of this. So for this section, observe only the feet. And you see the feet come off the ground after contact. So it's going to contact and then rotate. And what this is, is going to allow him to do by jumping, he can unlock the hips and therefore complete that residual rotation through. But because he's unlocking both the back hip and front hip together, his hips can rotate as one unit with his body and therefore his hips can stay quiet at contact. So why this footwork? Well, it helps you maintain a perfect axis of rotation because when you're suspended in the air, all right, you can't really lean, like when you're on the ground, you can use your legs and shift your center of balance or, or lean and push in different ways. When you're in the air, there's nothing to push off of. So as you can see, I'm gonna rotate as hard as I can. Watch how still my head is. No matter how hard I rotate, my head stays very still. Now, because I can't, you know, lean or reach or, or you know, change my center of balance in the air, my strike zone is going to remain fixed to this one point. So, at this one point, it's like, or I can only hit the ball right here. So, I have to get the spacing perfect. I have to get my weight transfer and rotation perfect. If you guys like that concept I did on the stop and pop earlier, this is essentially like a stop and pop for the lower body because your weight transfer rotation, again, because that strike zone is fixed, it gives you instant timing and feedback on that weight transfer. Boom. Here, focus your full attention on the point at which my feet release to the point at which I contact the ball. So these first few, I'm gonna strike it absolutely perfect. I'm gonna wait and then release right when the ball is in my power zone. You can feel that timing now. This next one is early. So I lose so much power by releasing early then I time it well again. And when you get the timing right, this can be a lethal footwork for punishing slow balls. If you notice, those past few were all from a closed stance. We're gonna now show you the same footwork from an open stance where the turn from the jump point to the land point is more abbreviated. And I can turn on the ball super duper fast. Therefore, my timing has to be perfect. That one was late. So I have to really feel my core strength, pull the racket around. That one was too early, so I lost power. That was perfect. The weight, and again, perfect. And on that note, look at the right side of the screen. I'm going to purposely space poorly to the ball and reach for the ball in this one. And there goes the axis of rotation. But trust me, it's not that hard with a little bit of practice. Now watch my feet. It's, this is going to be such a reliable shot for you. All right, once you get the timing down, once you get the skills to watch the ball into space properly, no problem. Even on this next shot, I'm going to be reaching for the ball slightly. But because your axis of rotation stays so straight, I can feel when I'm reaching, take pace off the ball a lot of the time, and still hit a decent shot. And lastly, because you're airborne and your feet aren't pushing off the ground in different ways, it's actually very easy for your hips to remain quiet. And therefore, from a kinetic chain standpoint, it's a little easier to feel the, the energy reach the tip of the racket as you turn. All right, you refer to the online program for if you want to learn a little bit more about this. Guys, but what you should feel when you're using this footwork, this helicopter footwork, is a lot of core strength, right? Here, to pull you around. If you aren't feeling a lot of core strength as you hit, then that means you're probably hitting too far out in front or reaching, right? But this ensures, again, with that fixed strike zone, that you're always making contact in a position of strength. Now, in terms of practical use for this footwork, again, because it might seem crazy, but I bet a lot of you already do this just naturally, subconsciously, without even thinking about it. But it's great for loading up and just punishing slower balls, slices, floaters, okay? From this close stance, you can really turn and just go boom, right? And hit the ball with a little bit more rotation. Now, you're likely gonna do this using a slightly bigger swing, because with that bigger swing, you'll have a little bit more momentum for the rack and the fall through to carry you around. It's also gonna be more commonly used on the forehand because you can take that bigger swing with more leverage to pull you around, okay? Like the backhand, it's hard to generate that type of rotational force to 
to do that so you won't see it as much. You can take maybe a bigger backswing and perhaps do it, but for your backhand, you're probably going to be rotating more so on the ground. Now, like my strokes, since they're very compact, as you may very well know, I do the abbreviated open stance version you know, much more often, but based on your swing size and your level of strength, I want you to definitely play around with this. A few more common examples you'll run into, watch the feet here. Always that residual momentum of the racket bringing those feet around from a closed stance. So th that rotation can complete, the hips can come through. Here's me doing it on the backhand side, which is rare. Okay, it's maybe when you're taking a bigger swing on the backside for some extra power. Here's an up-close look at that footwork. Now this is going to be a long point. Most of the time I use this footwork and I use it commonly like I said, but it's going to be that abbreviated open stance version. Watch the feet, okay, and again watch the feet one more time on this passing shot. Now last thing to note and very importantly, all right, is using this to aim. Obviously when I'm setting up for a closed stance here, because this front foot locks this front hip. Very hard for me to hit cross court. Why? Because I'm like reaching across my body as I hit, right? What this helicopter footwork allows you to do is from a very close position, okay, unlock the hip, hit the outside of the ball, and pull the ball across court. Okay, so from here I can pull the ball across court because whether I'm hitting line or cross, I need to get this shoulder behind the ball to get my body mass behind the ball. If I'm reaching across here, I have no strength, okay? So you can disguise, boom, and then use that to hit strong going both ways, all right? Here's a very strange footwork I want to show you. Now watch his front toe, and although it's going to be a good shot, it's very hard to go cross court because that front toe is facing the side fence. It's hard to open up the hips. Now you're going to see the helicopter footwork on a similar approach and it's going to be easy for me to open up the hips right there and I can pull the ball both ways no problem. But no, it's not the only way to open up and unlock the back hip. I can do it with a step back on that shot. You're going to see me now do a jumping step back to unlock both the back and front hip to get the ball cross court as well. Very important to keep in mind when you're working on this footwork, I recommend you drill it. It's, even if you don't use it in the match, it really helps smooth your mechanics out. All right, so leave your comments below. We're gonna end it on this. Thanks for sticking through parts one, two, and three on the rotation series, and look forward to seeing you guys on the next episode.